Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, Joel, we can hear you. Okay. So because uh, Ming Jun is facing some technical issues, I will take the time to brief uh, all the attendees about the current book building period that we have for the Hang Seng Tech ETF by Lion OCVC Securities. So Philip Securities is uh, one of the participating agents for this ETF. So our clients will be able to subscribe to the ETF during the initial offering period via, via your Poems account. So through this page, which I will send in the chat box later, you will learn more details on, about how you can subscribe using your Poems account and the steps that you will need to take in order to have your applications processed uh, successfully. So, so long as you have a Poems Ledger based account, you're eligible to subscribe. So the unit price is about 7.7 .7 Hong Kong dollars per unit and minimum quantity is 1,000 units at multiples of 1,000 units. So commission is 0.08% or minimum 50 Hong Kong dollars, whichever is higher. And if you are holding a cash management account, which means that your shares will be held with CDP, there will be an additional Hong Kong dollar 60 to transfer your shares to CDP. Then settlement currency will be in Hong Kong dollars. So you'll need to have Hong Kong dollars in your Poems account to ensure a successful application. So I will share this, um, this page link in, in, the chat, uh, in the chat box later, which you can assess. So Ming Jin, are you ready to present on your part? Yeah, I'm uh, actually still uh, having some issues with uh, my slides. Uh, probably we'll get uh, Vincent from Crane uh, to share with you uh, on his topic first before I will so, uh, share with you on what Philip Securities has uh, in offer for you at the end of the webinar. So Vincent, can I have uh, you to share your screen and then sure, uh, we'll no start off with the webinar. Okay. Just a second, please. So everyone can see it, right? Yeah, it's okay. good. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so hi, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's Vincent Chen from uh, CICC, uh, Hong Kong Securities Limited. Um, so um, today's topic is about riding the wave of China's internet giants. Uh, it's a huge topic, you know, about the Chinese uh, internet companies who have, you know, seen a lot of noise and a lot of hype in the, you know, previous months. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the CSI Overseas China Internet uh, Index, uh, the index went up by 57% uh, year to date uh, as of yesterday, and compared with NASDAQ going up by 35%, uh, and then uh, S&P about 20%. Uh, I mean, um, the Chinese Internet companies are really doing real well. So, in the past, you know, um, a lot of people know some of the big names, the household names, what we call the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. But uh, not a lot of people are aware of that, uh, are not aware of the fact that there are a lot of up and coming uh, internet companies that are doing very well. So for example, on the e-commerce side, we have uh, JD and Ping Duo Duo. Uh, on the gaming side, we have you know, NetEase, as well as uh, Tencent, obviously. And then on the uh, online education side, we have TAL Education, as well as uh, New Oriental. And then on the ent entertainment side, we have Aichi, as well as Billy Billy. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, Chinese internet companies that are doing very well. So today, I would like to take advantage of the time and uh, to talk, you know, really introduce uh, the opportunities uh, that are, you know, posed by uh, the, the growth of all these Chinese internet companies. So uh, this is kind of an introduction uh, for CICC. So CICC is a listed company uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. It's the first uh, joint venture bank uh, between Morgan Stanley and CCB. Uh, it's, uh, really the leading investment bank in China. It's headquartered in Beijing, and we have offices in Hong Kong, New York, London, Singapore, San Francisco, Frankfurt, and Tokyo. And I'm personally based in New York. And also, um, you know, Crane Shares is also part of CICC. Uh, our, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Xiaolin Chen, will talk about Crane Shares, uh, you know, as well as uh, some of the, her views about the uh, China internet company as well uh, in the later part of this uh, webinar. Um, so Crankshaw is also um, you know, a, a major ETF provider in the US and in Europe as well. So I would like to um, uh, let Shaolin you know, talk a, a little bit more about uh, Crankshaw later as well. Um, so here I will give you an overview of uh, Chinese ADRs uh, in the United States. 
So uh, kind of a background. So, um, you know, ADR 101, if you will. So here's a chart that compares uh, US, Asia, and uh, Asia market. So obviously, um, you know, the US stock market includes mostly uh, American local companies, but it also includes a lot of overseas companies, uh, you know, like the Chinese ADRs. Uh, on the other hand, you know, A share, you know, mainly uh, Chinese companies and X shares have, uh, you know, kind of a combination of both. Um, and on the sector side, um, you know, the NICE, the New York Stock Exchange, is dominated by stocks in IT, financials, consumer discretionary, and also some old economy stocks like banks or um, some industrials. And while NASDAQ uh, is dominated by, you know, IT, internet companies, and, you know, most of the China's ADR are listed uh, in the NASDAQ uh, exchange, but, you know, uh, companies like Alibaba or some others are also listed in NICE as well. Um, so uh, on the other hand, you know, Asia is relatively more evenly distributed in terms of the sector. Um, and, you know, it includes both old and new economy, but in terms of the internet companies, most of them are listed offshore. Um, and uh, in terms of the number of uh, listed stocks, so the US stock market is around uh, more than 5,000 uh, companies uh, with the Chinese ADRs around uh, 250. Uh, for the total market cap uh, is um, more than 50 trillion US dollars, which is much larger than Asia and Asia's market. Um, so for the major indexes for the US market, you have Dow Jones, you have s and uh, NASDAQ, Russell 2000, um, and HXC, which is the NASDAQ Dragon Index. Uh, Asia is, um, you know, have CSI 400, uh, SSE Composite, uh, et cetera. And then for the HS, we have Hang Seng, HSEI, uh, and as well as Hang Seng Tech uh, that are re recently launched as well. Um, so in terms of the uh, assets, uh, you know, US stock market is much more open, um, you know, compared with the Asia markets. For the Asia, obviously, uh, if you want to get access to the market, you, you can you know, get access through the uh, Stock Connect uh, uh, via the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, or um, you can also get access, you know, as, if you're an instit institution, you can you know, access the market with QV or RQV for those stocks that are not available on the uh, you know, Stock Connect program. So um, in terms of the valuation, um, I think right now, you, 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 know, you see a lot of you know, uh, you know, US market hitting record high, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, PE ratios, uh, S&P is trading at around 25 uh, PE ratio right now, NASDAQ 38. Um, and then on the other hand, if you look at Hang Seng, HSI is uh, 13, HSEI is 10, CSI 100 is 16. So in terms of valuation, you can see US is much more expensive. But on the other hand, uh, you can see that uh, despite all its, uh, you know, valuation, you see the market has keep, you know, keep on going. You have, we have been talking about the valuation story for a long time. You know, uh, Hang Seng has been, you know, on the lower side of the PE ratio, but it underperformed, you know, uh, U.S. stock market for quite, and even Asia market for quite a long time. So valuation is not, you know, the only metrics or only parameters that you would consider, uh, because of the fact that most of the, you know, high growing. IT internet companies are listed in the US. So, you know, relatively the valuation is a little higher. So in terms of the history of the uh, ADRs, uh, you can see the chart here. Um, it really started uh, from 2005 where Baidu, uh, you know, listed on NASDAQ and the stock price uh, rose by, you know, more than triple on that day. Um, you see a lot of up and down in this chart. So starting from 2005 and then up to 2007, you see a kind of a, you know, uh, record high at that, at that point, um, you know, with uh, 31 Chinese companies listed on that year alone. And then because of the financial crisis, you know, a lot of companies, you know, delisted or privatized. And then, you know, um, you know the market went down a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, after the financial crisis, you see the, you know, the stock price coming up again, you know, for companies like Baidu or, and some others. And more Chinese companies starting to list, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, from 2008, uh, and then in 2010, you know, there are more uh, news coming up, you know, the SEC also has some sort of, you know, uh, you know in investigation at, at that point. And then some other, com some Chinese companies also try to privatize. Uh, so you see the, the, the market, the index went down to, uh, to a low point at 2012. And then, you know, in 2014 is a big year for, um, you know, Chinese ADRs, you know, 50, Chinese companies listed uh, in 2014 alone, including Alibaba, JD, and Weibo. So you see a lot of you know, great companies, you know, the big names are listed that year. 
and then you know you know up up until that point you know you see the market really you know hit up uh you know uh, since 2014 and uh you know uh you see more and more big names coming up you know kl pindodo all these companies also got listed in 2018 so um you know we see a lot of up and downs but you know generally speaking the market has been doing well the, the market has been growing up so in terms of the uh, number of ADRs, uh, there are currently 247 Chinese ADRs. Uh, some of them are, have primary listings on the Hong Kong market, including China Mobile or PetroChina, but most of them are the tech companies you know, with primary listing uh, in the US. So in terms of the uh, market value, market cap, uh, from a um, you know, number standpoint, most, uh, around 70%, of the uh, Chinese ADRs have market cap below one billion US dollars, uh, whereas uh, you know uh, we have you know one of the biggest you know tech company in the world in Alibaba having uh, seven hundred billion US dollars in market cap. So uh, there are thirty um, thirty companies um, with more than ten billion US dollars market cap, forty seven with one to ten billion, and the rest is uh, really below one billion. So I would say, you know, most of the big names, most of the uh, household names are, you know, on the, you know, higher end of the market cap category. And in terms of the, um, you know, the fundraise, you can see, especially in 2014, you know, uh, you know, with Alibaba, with JD, you know, um, the Chinese ADRs really uh, have the highest amount of, you know, capital raised uh, on that year. And in terms of the sector, I think it's one really interesting part is that uh, if you compare the Hong Kong market, versus the uh, Chinese ADRs. So obviously most of the ADRs are, you know, focusing on the new economy sector, you know, including the technology, the internet, the software, you know, consumer discretionary, uh, retail, telecommunication and healthcare. So more than 90% of the Chinese ADRs in terms of the market cap are, you know, focusing on new economy sectors, which we, we, we really bullish on, we, you know, CICC crane shares, we all bullish on, the new economy sectors and green shares even have a couple of products that you know go around that kind of idea so uh on the other hand if you compare with the hong kong market um you know less than 30 percent of the hong kong market cap are focusing on you know information technology and the new economy sectors you know the a large chunk of the uh, market cap uh, of the hang Seng index are financials some are you know utilities or energy or industrials but you know, um, I mean, increasingly there are more Chinese ADRs coming to Hong Kong to do secondary listings. So, for example, you see Alibaba came to the uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, you know, to to cross list uh, to have a secondary listing in in Hong Kong. And then, you know, this year we see JD um, and that is also follow the footsteps of uh, you know, Alibaba as well. So you might see more tech companies, uh, you know, uh, to be included in the Hong Kong the market, but I mean, uh, uh, generally speaking, most of the uh, ADRs are still focused on, uh, you know, on the US. So in terms of the liquidity, um, you can see that, um, you know, most of the uh, liquidity are focused on the, you know, top names. So, uh, you know, the average daily turnover that exceeded uh, 100 million US dollars, including Alibaba, Baidu, JD, Pinduoduo, Nanis, uh, Neo, IG, Citra, et cetera. So all these uh, big names, you know, by the way, all most of these names are also included in the CSI Overseas China Internet in, uh, Index, which uh, my colleague uh, Xiaolin will introduce to you later. Um, you know, like I said, you know, some of the ADRs are also considering, you know, the secondary listings in Hong Kong. So uh, in terms of the uh, equity financing amounts, you know, Hong Kong, you know, ranked number one, you know, even uh, higher than NASDAQ and US Exchange last year. So we might see more and more ADRs coming to Hong Kong for you know valuation reasons as well as for regulatory reasons. Uh, but I think you know at this point we are still seeing most of the uh, Chinese tech companies that are having their listing in the U.S. And you know some in Hong Kong increasingly we will see more. But I think at this point we are, we are seeing you know more uh, tech internet uh, companies from China still listed uh, in the U.S. So uh, some of the possible candidates you know that. Uh, might consider, uh, you know, secondary listing in Hong Kong uh, are included in this chart. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a chart, you know, shortlisted by uh, our, uh, you know, research analysts based on four different criteria that are stipulated by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, which allows, you know, uh, more and more ADRs uh, to come to Hong Kong 
um, you know, uh, with market value exceeding uh, 40 billion, and also you know, focus on new economy sectors. So some of these names, you know, JD.com, Baidu, NetEast, TL, New Oriental Education. These are also the big names that are currently listed in red that might possibly, you know, uh, have their secondary listing in Hong Kong going forward. So when we look at the recent performance uh, of some of the uh, Chinese ADRs, uh, you know, generally speaking, they are doing very well. So for example, uh, the big names like you know, Alibaba uh, have a year-to-day performance of uh, 32%, uh, JD 154%, uh, Pinduoduo 280%. I'm, you know, I'm reading the latest data you know, as of yesterday. Uh, Bilibili, um, you know, an online entertainment platform, you know, grow by 237% uh, year to date. Net is 59%. So a lot of Chinese companies are doing very well, despite, you know, uh, you know uh, the world economy is, is uh, facing the challenge of COVID-19. Uh, but, you know, a lot of uh, internet companies, you know, actually benefited from this, uh, you know, a pandemic, you know, partly because of the fact that a lot of people are staying at home. So they have to rely on online education, online entertainment, online shopping. So a lot of these companies are actually doing very well. Um, so these are some of the um, you know valuations and some of the uh, companies that you know are covered by you know, CICC research. Um, you know most of them are listed in the US, in the US, but you also see a couple of uh, names uh, listed in Hong Kong, including Tencent. Um, you know generally speaking, you know they are you know doing very well in terms of their fundamentals. The revenues have been growing. Uh, so and and also our you know, uh, and also because of the COVID-19, some of the, um, you know, uh, platform, the online education platform, online shopping platform also benefiting from the, uh, you know, the situation. So uh, you can see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, outperform rating from CICC on these names. I'm not supposed to recommend any stock in this webinar, so I'm not going to talk in details about the names, but I just want to focus uh, on the fact that a lot of Chinese companies have been doing very well in terms of the share price, uh, and as well as, uh, you know, uh, uh, as well as for, uh, from the fundamental financial standpoint. So um, I will talk a little bit about the subsectors, um, you know, of the China internet giants. Um, so here, uh, for example, uh, on the online search platform, you see, you know, Baidu is obviously the biggest player uh, in this uh, subsector. Uh, so in October, Baidu see, uh, you know, uh, growth in terms of the monthly active user. So this, uh, you see three acronyms here, MAU, DAU, DTS, these are the, you know, the main metrics for uh, internet or, or apps, um, online mobile apps uh, companies. So MAU stands for monthly active users, um, DAU stands for daily active users, and DTS stands for the daily total time spent. So uh, if you see more active users on a monthly or daily basis, that means, you know, if there are more uh, users there that are uh, you're subscribing to your service and there are more users that are you know uh, you know uh, concentrating on, on on what you are doing right now so if you look at the MAU numbers you know Baidu has seen a steady growth ever since uh, the, uh, June 2019 from 470 uh, million users from uh, 546 uh, last month DAU you see similar trend 185 June on June uh, 19. Uh, and 210, uh, 12 on October 2020. And then, you know, they also spent more time on the search engine as well. So Baidu has been, that's a good deal for Baidu. And you see Baidu is pretty much a monopoly in this market. So, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of other users, uh, you know, are, are, are the second place, so go, so go and others, uh, you know, much have much lower users numbers compared with Baidu. So on, in terms of e-commerce, it's really the star, really the focus. Uh, of the uh, you know China internet giant, my colleagues uh, you know Xiaoling will talk a lot more about it uh, later on. So I here I just show you kind of a general numbers here. You know, so ever since uh, 2018, you see um, a high a high double digit growth for the online retail sales numbers. So generally about uh, about 20 percent. So the latest figure is 21.4 percent in October. So despite you know all this uh, pandemic uh, conversation, we are seeing. Uh, positive numbers uh, consistently, uh, you know, ever since the start of the year. So, um, you know, the e-commerce uh, sector is really doing very well. Um, so in terms of the e-commerce, uh, one of the latest numbers, uh, you see the online sales growing by 21.4% year to uh, year on year. 
Uh, in terms of the MAU, DAU, DATS, you also see you know huge positive number as well. So for example, Taobao also see uh, you know DTS of 18.4%. That means the Chinese internet user is spending roughly 20% more time uh, you know, on Taobao alone, uh, you know, to do online shopping and, and others, including single day sales. And um, you know, Tmall also sees similar, similar figures, 20.6% uh, in DTS. Uh, JD 10.3%. Uh, Ping Dodo is um, um, ha having uh, similar numbers in terms of the MAU and DAU as well. So if you look at the chart here, uh, you see uh, Tmall is uh, having a big biggest share in terms of the grand merchandise value uh, in B2C uh, online shopping market, and then JD uh, in number two as well, and then Suning in number three. Uh, but you see, you know, Tmall actually account for more than half of the uh, online uh, grand merchandise value here for the uh, online shopping market. Um, so here are the numbers that, that I just mentioned, you know, um, three big players, uh, you know, Alibaba, uh, you know, which, um, you know, focus on Taobao and then uh, as well as AliExpress and some other platforms, uh, JD, Pindodo, all these e-commerce giants are seeing huge numbers. Uh, in terms of the uh, the monthly active users, daily active users, you, for example, you see Taobao have seven and seven hundred and seventy six million users. These are huge numbers. It's uh, you know more than double of the you know uh, population of the United States uh, just for the Taobao you know user platform. Uh, JD have three hundred thirty million users, uh, active users. That means they have. They had the users at least open the app for for uh, you know once in the past month. Uh, Pinduoduo with uh, 546 million users, uh, monthly active users as well. So, you know, huge market here, which my colleague will cover a little later on. So for Alibaba, you know, um, you know there's a nice little chart in, in you know um, in uh, Crane Share's presentation. So I'll let my colleague talk about that later on. Uh, and but you know, apart from Alibaba, which is a household name. JD and Pinduoduo is also doing very well. So um, in terms of the business model, JD, you know, take a little different approach. So JD takes on the inventory and fulfills the orders you know, and, and have their own logistic net network. Whereas Alibaba, you know, focus on, you know, providing the platform uh, which allows, you know, um, uh, online retailers, online merchandisers uh, to, uh, you know, connect by themselves. Uh, so JD uh, uh, really market itself and you know brand itself as a more premium uh, online uh, e-commerce platform. So as you can see from the uh, average order number. So in terms of the average order number, JD.com uh, have a four, a 60 US dollars um, per person uh, per order. And, and Taobao has 30 uh, US dollars and Pinduoduo has six uh, US dollars. So, so even for e-commerce, you have you know different uh, tiers, different um, you know subcategories where the uh, e-commerce giants are focusing on. So Alibaba is really focusing on more like the general e-commerce market. JD focus more on the premium market uh, and you know focus more on the quality and logistics um, you know uh, service that they provide. And Pinduoduo is you know most of the users are on, on the first tier city and they you know pride themselves with their you know active focus on the um, you know, social uh, media platforms. So for example, they have the uh, WeChat uh, platform uh, where uh, people posting about, you know, buying stuff in Pinduoduo with a discount. Uh, and they pride themselves with their active uh, involvement with, uh, with the community in the social media. So we really have different, um, you know, e-commerce uh, uh, platforms that are doing, focusing on different sectors and, and are doing really well at the same time. So they are compete, competing with each other uh, but at the same time, the, the pie is really go, growing as well. So here is uh, the uh, chart for online games. So for the online games uh, platform, you see you know, Tencent uh, you know, uh, accounts for more than half of the market right now. And then also you see NetEase and 37 uh, you know, following uh, you know, Tencent in the ranking. Uh, in terms of the top 10 mobile games, you see you know, Honor of the Kings rank number one. Some of you may be playing this as well on your you know, uh, mobile phone, uh, which is, you know, Wang Zhenrongyao. And also um, in the Magic Blade mobile, you know, also from Tencent doing very well. So online games is also, uh, you know, one of the highlights of the uh, China internet market as well. If you look at the um, uh, other sectors, you know, like online travel agencies, uh, relatively, you know, struggling this year because, you know, 
uh, because of the COVID-19, you see, uh, you know, much less traffic and much less uh, traveling, uh, you know, globally. But because of the fact that, you know, China is recovering relatively earlier compared with, you know, the rest of the world. So actually you see a lot of number already recovering very well. So for example, if you look at sea trip, uh, you, if you look at the DAU, uh, the daily active users already, uh, you know, went up, uh, go, went back to 90% of what they have last year. And also in terms of the DDS, you see similar numbers, um, you know, uh, in October's that recovers more than 85% already. So I think they are, I mean, obviously they, they are not, you know, some of the brightest star uh, this year, but they have a chance to catch up because of the fact that, you know, most of them are already recovering from the pandemics, you know, with the internal uh, travel in China. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, other sectors, you know, online videos, um, uh, which is also doing very well. Um, you know, the, the fastest growing time has, you know, was, was uh, behind, but we also see, you know, um, double digit growth uh, 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 in 2012, uh, 22, and also this year we are showing, you know, 8% growth as well. You know, some of the, uh, you know, big names, you know, Tencent, you know, one of the biggest player in the entertainment online video sector uh, with 114 uh, million subscribers. IG, you know, uh, some of the, the people, you know, call it the Netflix of China, also uh, doing decently. And one of the brightest stars really is Billy Billy, which is also in the CSI Overseas China Internet Index, which my colleague will describe later. Uh, Billy Billy is, has, you know, have share price more than triple this year. Um, you know, really doing very well, and the uh, share price grew about 237 percent, uh, with more than 184 million active users. And you know, they are still and you know, experience high growth because right now most of the users are really the young users, you know, below 35 years old. So well, as they expand their you know um, coverage on the other age group groups, we are seeing you know potential growth as well. So uh, you know, without further ado, this is my contact. So uh, I will just pass uh, the time to my colleague, you know, Crane Shares, uh, from Crane Shares, Dr. Xiaolin Chen, based in uh, London, to talk about the fundamentals of China internet, uh, e-commerce, uh, comparison between US and, you know, China internet companies, and also the index, uh, CSI overseas uh, China internet index. So I'll let uh, Xiaolin to uh, continue with the presentation. Perfect. So just bear with me, let me share the screen, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. And um, good evening to, to everyone there. I know it's very late in Singapore right now and uh, we really appreciate uh, you know your time and obviously the opportunity speaking with you to introduce you who we are and what we do for our clients globally. Funnily enough, I uh, used to live in uh, Kuala Lumpur for uh, six years, but I never had an opportunity to visit Singapore over the six years time. So I do hope at some point in time, uh, Vincent and I have the pleasure to meet all of you in person, obviously when the environment permit us to do so. Uh, my name is Shaolin Chen. I'm the head of international at Crenshaw's base uh, off in London. Um, Really, let me uh, start um, by uh, telling you a little bit about uh, Crane Shares, about the firm. Crane Shares uh, founder, Jonathan Crane, really formed, uh, you know, two core beliefs, uh, you know, during his experience living and building a successful business in China. Uh, these were the basis for us founding Crane Shares about seven years ago. First, well, new China sectors such as domestic consumption, internet, e-commerce, and clean energies uh, have become the new driver of the uh, China's economic growth. This asset class of China uh, capital market is still uh, hugely underallocated, uh, you know, to global portfolios. Second, the opening of China's uh, mainland equity uh, and fixed income market will have a significant uh, effect on clients' portfolio in the years to come. And uh, as you know, the inclusion efforts continue. Uh, to happen. Our role at Crenshaws is really to help our clients uh, globally to access and benefit from such growth happening in the country and capitalize uh, you know, them in an investable uh, vehicle or investable way. Uh, Crenshaws is majority owned 
by CICC, Vincent uh, mentioned earlier on. CICC is the largest investment bank uh, in China and co-founded by Morgan Stanley back in 1990s. Uh, I was start here. I think Vincent shared a lot of interesting names and uh, from a bottom-up perspective of how we look at certain themes and, and, and trending and evolving in China capital markets. I will take a step back uh, to look together with you on some of the macro development we have seen in China. Many of these you have seen uh, before, the numbers, I'm not going to repeat that, but I'd like to share some of the histories and experience that uh, we always use and to share with our clients when we have a uh, client conversations. I think uh, we all remember over 41 years ago uh, in 1979, that Chairman Deng Xiaoping announced the reform and open policy uh, that allowed individuals and also private firms you know, to, to, to support and set up the support of the economy and particularly participating uh, you know, and can contribute to the country's growth. I'm not sure how many of you actually know, I'm very proud to learn this fact, but also after learning it from others, is um, China literally published its own GDP. So China did the analysis and research and start to publish its first GDP ever, uh, was only back in 1986. Um, it took China about 20 plus years to grow its GDP from somewhere around 300 plus billion dollars, million dollars to over $14 trillion today to become the second largest economy uh, in the world. What a remarkable achievement over only 20 plus years. Over the past 30 years that the Chinese companies has developed a competitive age and gained a vast experience across industries, we proved in practice that they possess the required skills and expertise to lead the industrial revolution and also become the world leaders in each respect sectors. In 1980s, uh, the rural reform remarkably uh, increased the agricultural productivities. If you remember, uh, that reform almost freed one third of the labor force in China. Back then, the migrant population uh, was only somewhere around five and a half million people. Uh, however, in, since 1995, uh, more than 20 million people, you hear that right, more than, more than 20 million people every year migrate from the urban, uh, from the rural to the urban area each year. And today, China's urban population is over uh, 810 million people. I like Vincent, the comparison to US, I live in London, so I compared that 810 million people living in city, that's almost double the entire European Union's population. With more people living in cities and they can access to a better education. Uh, and as a result, when they graduate, they get a better job uh, and earning a higher income. You can imagine they would demand for better services uh, to improve their life quality. For many, many years, the industry sector was the key contributor to China's growth. And this drew many investors' attention. In our opinion, this was necessary and needed for the country to develop in its own pace and also uh, really to, to get ready and connect uh, with the, you know, uh, the rest of the world, right? Uh, the country has more than 1 million modern bridges today. Many of the builds are due to geological needs. So for instance, 67% of China's land is made up of mountains, hills, and highlands. So you can imagine 90 out of the 100 bridges in, you know, in terms of height in the 21st centuries across the world are in China today. Uh, however, rebalance to a sustainable economic model was always in the policymakers' mind. Indeed, since 2013, you see on this page is China has successfully transitioned its economy to service-driven service -driven model. This structural change is evident in many ways and in our opinion was contributed significantly uh, by the fastest and the largest urbanization happening in the country. Today, with more people living in cities and more wealth accumulated than ever, the Chinese people are demanding for better healthcare services, for instance, 
and also access to technology and better treatments, improve services across different locations and better availabilities almost at any time, anywhere. In 2000, only 85 million people have mobile subscriptions. Fast forward to today, there are over 1.6, well, the latest number we could get is 2018, 1.6 you know, billion subscriptions in China. This massive user base encourage companies to rapidly developing services uh, for online, you know, for, for on the mobile phone to offer a consumer more of, you could think of all-in-one kind of uh, capabilities to accommodate their modern lives. And the Chinese uh, technology uh, companies are tireless, tirelessly, I think tirelessly in broadening their business streams and continuously in you know, enhancing their technology infrastructures, mainly become the world leaders in their business segment. But are these Chinese domestic consumers as solid as corporates by contributing to the e-commerce market growth? Take a look on uh, the numbers uh, at the numbers on this page. China's total retail sales recorded a 5.8 trillion sales in uh, in last year, and that compares to all uh, you know. Uh, if you look at the e-commerce, so we, when we do online, that market recorded 1.5 trillion in 2019. That number is more than doubled when compared to the United States. And all this number achieved with only 61% if the populations have an internet access. Think of that number. So there's still significant room to catch up. If you look at US, there's over or close to 90% of people have, or the population, have the access to, to the internet. What are the billions of mobile phone subscribers doing with their phone? In fact, China is the world's largest and fastest growing country in terms of buying and using apps. Take a look at the spending in the Apple uh, app stores that the Chinese consumers spend double to those users in the United States. Sorry, I moved too fast. But you almost wanted to ask if this is a sustainable growth to continue uh, this way. We would say yes, for a reason of the consumer today are spending more time on, on their apps, but also for multiple purposes of using uh, you know, the app or doing online. They vary from entertainment, social media, online shopping, manage their finance or browse news. What made the Chinese companies become leaders in offering these services. I guess one of the most you know, important advantage for being in a developing country, you know what, let me just, just bear with me for a second. For being a developing country is you learn from the current, right? And you develop and building from the most recent and China is indeed leapfrogged the entire new technology ecosystems and almost jump to the most advantaged stages and straight away. What do I mean by that? Today, no one in China take a wallet. They pay everything with their mobile phone, even for donating at a temple. You know, many companies get encouraged to expand their business and offer a complete chain of services for consumers. For example, I know um, uh, Vincent mentioned the name, but take a look at Alibaba, no introduction needed. It is world the biggest online e-commerce company that hosts millions of merchants and business dominate dominate eighty percent of China online shopping market. So not only produced thirty plus billion dollars sales on a single state event, but also have a massive, massive diversified business into entertainment, financials, cloud business, AI, healthcare. I give you another example: Ten Cents. You know the company founded in nineteen ninety nine. Over the years, it has diversified its business from a PC to mobile, from a social network instant messaging services provider to build their core ecosystem around WeChat. And today, that app has over 1 billion active users around the world. It is the dominant player in growing from connecting people to taking business to consumers to offering a tool allowing users to manage their daily activities. With all these remarkable achievements by these Chinese technology companies, that it would be interesting to have a comparisons versus their 
equivalence of obviously close as possible to see if they also produce higher expected revenue. Here we compare the top 10 holdings in the CSI Overseas China Internet Index versus a comparable US entity on a projected one year basis. These companies are projected to achieve over 9% of performance in revenue and 13% over the five year uh, period. It is also encouraging to see, and we often get asked, um, do we continue to see a healthy pipeline? Uh, obviously upcoming that we can continue to benefit from the trend and allowing investors to uh, invest in them. On this page, you will see, it is very encouraging to see obviously that uh, many more names come to become the largest uh, internet company by market cap that are from China. And also the pipelines of the upcoming IPOs or the potential IPOs, four of them are from China. The business streams are very uh, you know, diversified. For example, Didi, we know the name, I guess many, many of you travel to China, use them. It's the Uber equivalents that dominates the Chinese domestic uh, market. Kuaishou is the video sharing platforms that had topped the Google Play and Apple App Store for the most downloaded least in eight countries outside of China. It has over 200 million active daily users in 2019. So what are we trying to achieve here? Our goal is really to construct a solution, a strategy that wrap all these fascinating investment opportunities into one investable fund and strategies that allow investors like you to benefit from companies offering the services along the entire ecosystems. So the CSI Overseas China Internet Index is an index that we at Crenshaw's actively constructed with CSI, the index provider, to ensure that we capitalize this active investment scene into a passive constructed index for the fund to track. The index is obviously designed for investors to accessing uh, you know, the true growth engine of China's growth now and for decades to come. The new China sectors we called the leaders that are shaping the industries and benefiting and capitalizing from the largest middle class consumer power in the world. Clearly, not, uh, you know, the past performance is not a guarantee of future performance. And we see clients stay invested in um, this strategy for medium to long term uh, that are uh, benefited from the return uh, of the index. Our goal is really to exchange some of the interesting trends we observe happening in China's uh, capital market. Over the years, ours obviously engaging with our uh, conversations with our clients, we have seen increasing interest in gaining market insights on China. We believe investors now more than ever uh, need to understand the world's second largest economy. Uh, obviously, we at Green Shares, my colleagues and I, uh, endeavor to earn your trust uh, by providing a balanced perspective on China's economics and the capital market scene. We continue to be available uh, at your disposal to share any interesting trends uh, we present to our clients uh, as an access or as in, uh, uh, a potential offer opportunity to pair with your other allocations in China. Obviously, I'm happy to take any question at the end, but uh, back to you, Joe. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Xiaoling, for the presentation. So for the attendees who have any questions and that you would like to ask Vincent or Xiaoling, please direct them to the Q&A chat box which you can see at the bottom of your screen. And Vincent and Xiaoling will take the questions. Yes. Okay, I think uh, in the meantime, uh, I will be sharing slides on uh, Philips Securities while uh, the questions come in. So uh, once I go through over my portion, uh, we will get Vincent and Xiaoling to uh, answer the questions that uh, they are from our clients. So uh, just give me one moment. Okay, so uh, basically I'll just be touching on uh, some features and promotions that uh, Philips Securities has uh, for our clients. Okay, so uh, the first thing first is uh, the Lion OCBC Securities Hang Seng Tech ETF that uh, actually Joel uh, went through uh, at the beginning of this webinar. 
So uh, if you have any questions with regards to this, uh, do post it in the Q&A tab as well. So that, uh, in fact, Joel and uh, Joel will be able to answer them uh, uh, regarding this. So the next one is that uh, if you do not have a margin account, and uh, so if you like to, to make larger investments uh, with uh, Philip Securities, we for no all new margin accounts uh, will be able to enjoy uh, quite a good rate in terms of uh, share financing rates. So basically, why do you want to trade uh, using margins? Uh, you there, there are four main reasons over here. So uh, you can potentially make a larger investments. Okay, there is also something called a positive carry, uh, which means your dividends and uh, uh, interest earned are actually higher than the cost of uh, borrowing funds. Okay, so uh, though these, these are some of the advantages of using uh, margin facilities to actually uh, uh, carry on your trading journey with us. Okay, so for more information, do tune in or find out from your trading representative if you require further information and they will be able to share with you more. Okay, and then uh, there is uh, this last thing that uh, I think one of the last thing that I'd like to share here is uh, on our market journals that are written by uh, our dealers and also uh, Joel. You can see the first article here that, uh, that is being uh, shown under the pop popular articles in uh, the market journals. Uh, five ETFs you can invest through CPF investment schemes. And then uh, we also have that we have also topics on uh, tax sectors, uh, elections that had, that had uh, just gone through in uh, November, the US elections. So uh, there are quite a lot of information here in, uh, in our market journals. So if you have uh, the time and you are more interested in reading up some of these, you can actually find it on our poems uh, website. Under the education tab, you will be able to find this market journal. And uh, there are a lot of uh, articles and this is actually updated quite regularly. So uh, do find more information on that. And uh, yeah, so uh, if you have interest in technical analysis, uh, you can actually sign up for our weekly uh, technical analysis by our research uh, analyst, uh, Wei Ren. So he will be sharing on uh, TA views uh, every week. And th that can be found also under our education events and seminars tab. Okay, lastly, uh, I think uh, I also shared with you on uh, the link of our, for our Telegram group chat. So uh, this link is, uh, I mean, this group chat in Telegram is, uh, is basically what we are doing uh, to create a community for our invest investors, okay? So that you can ask any questions, news can be shared there, uh, new webinars, seminars, for example, will also be shared there. A lot of information is there, you can discuss uh, uh, anything that is do that, that has to do with uh, uh, foreign equities, not just uh, ETS, uh, and also uh, we don't do not just discuss on Singapore. There is another chat regarding the Singapore equities. So this chat here is all on foreign equities, but uh, there is a heavy focus more in the US because it is, uh, after all, the biggest uh, stock market in the world. Yep. So if you have any queries, uh, do feel free to contact us. Uh, this is our uh, contact. So my name is Ming Jin here. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, so this is the contact number and the email address to reach us. Okay, with that, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I will hand it over to Vincent and Xiaoling for the Q&A session. Um, okay, yeah, so I, have a, I saw a couple of questions here. Um, so I'll try to answer them uh, you know, as much as time allow. Um, so some, some of, the, some of um, you know, I see a question from Albert Han and also another person, um, you in light, uh, to, you know, uh, asking about, you know, whether there will be, a, you know, the, the listing of Chinese companies in the U.S. Um, I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, the conversation about the listing in the past few months is a little bit overhyped. So, um, I mean, even, you know, during the Trump administration, when you look at the Senate bill, uh, you know, the Senate is pretty much dominated by the Republicans. Um, you see um, in the bill, uh, basically, uh, it allows uh, three years time that Chinese companies to rectify the accounting practice, uh, you know, in compliance with the public company uh, accounting oversight board, PCAOB, which is a regulatory body uh, for, you know, the auditing uh, financials of the listed companies. 
Um, so I'll give you a number um, to, to, to uh, you know, strengthen my case. So currently there are more than a billion, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. investors own more than one trillion U.S. dollars uh, of U.S. listed Chinese companies. So it's not like you can just kick all these companies away because a lot of these companies are owned by American investors. And then from a compliance standpoint, if you look at the data uh, by PCAOB, which is the regulatory body, 90% of the US listed Chinese companies were audited by the big four accounting firms. So I think you know, there might be a possibility that some of the smaller companies might need to rectify their accounting numbers or auditing uh, practice. But I would expect a majority of the Chinese ADRs will still hold up pretty well regardless of whether it's a Trump or, you know, upcoming Biden administration. So, you know, this is kind of my take. Um, you know, Shani can jump in uh, if you want. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Thank you for the question. I think uh, it's in most of the investors' mind, uh, less to the extent in Europe, I would say, but um, uh, I think probably about two things. One, investors today are more matured than reacting to the headline news to uh, punish or compensate the company in any ways you would imagine that's one uh, and and man, uh, Vincent mentioned the timeline that I think there will be sufficient timeline to comply with the requirement or preparing for uh, certain changes for the underlying company and also for uh, the investors invest in such company right and then on, and the second I would highlight is uh, I'm an optimist right these are hard uh, to read uh, of uh, afraid of the outcome, but I think on the contrary, this will accelerate the reforms uh, in China's onshore capital market that is been going on for a very long time. And that will be uh, accelerate the pace and to the certain extent that investors like you and I would benefit from such of the long-term effect. I give you an example that the recent launch tech board in China uh, onshore in Shanghai. Uh, in my opinion, that was a result that people uh, in onshore and the policy and regulators are seeing. Eventually, they would have to come up with a place allowing companies like Alibaba to list, right? Um, if you remember about six, seven years ago when Alibaba doing the leasing in Nazi, it wasn't even possible to do the leasing in Shanghai. They don't meet the leasing rules in Shanghai as a new startup, as a, as a, you know, a, a you know, a startup, a tech company to list uh, locally there because the rules and everything wouldn't allow it. Uh, now, uh, you know, they have no choice but go to Nazi. Obviously they're coming back to onshore, but I just gave you examples that the new listing rules for the startup, for the tech, for the innovative per se uh, business are now allowed to list it in certain board uh, in onshore. So I think that's a huge development towards to such um, that, uh, you know, as a result of, you know, the ongoing headlines between the two countries to improve the financial market systems and conditions. I just give it some of that. I'll just pause there because we do have a few questions to go through. Sure. Yeah, I wanted, um, you know, highlight some of the questions. Maybe I re aggregate some of the questions. So one of the attendees asked about what, whether it's better to use ETFs or mutual funds, you know, to capture the China's, uh, you know, internet market as is relatively efficient. And there's another um, question. Um, is there any comparable ETF on the market that tracks the Chinese tech company? So now, um, obviously, Crane Shares is a, you know, major ETF provider, you know, focusing on China, uh, you know, but we are not supposed to talk about the ETF names and ticker here. If you want any advice uh, on the ETF investment, you can always, you know, ask the uh, you know, the, the expert uh, from Philip Securities. But I just want to highlight, you know, the CSI Overseas China Internet Index is a very, you know, well-established index. Uh, you know, uh, the performance has been doing very well and there's an ETF around, you know, tracking this benchmark, which also have a huge AUM number, which, which is also one of the largest Chinese ETF uh, in the world. So you might also want to take a look at that and also check our website as well. So uh, just to give you some numbers, uh, the CSI Overseas China Internet Index actually have a performance of year-to-date performance of 57%. So going back to the question, whether it's better to use ETF and mutual funds. 
So I think it's more about you know, a broader question, whether you know you understand the difference between both vehicles. So obviously EPS enjoy the benefits of uh, you know more transparency, better liquidity in terms of the you know uh, uh, you know you can trade in the secondary market as well as the primary market. You know as well as the fact that it has a generally lower fee compared with active mutual funds. Now, uh, if you look at the numbers, more than eighty percent of the active mutual fund managers underperform uh, you know ETFs or passive funds. So I mean, if you look at the Chinese tech companies, you know there there are always period where some companies are doing very well, and some companies are doing less well. So I think um, as an active manager, it might be a little bit difficult to pick you know the the winners for every single period and every single year, and it's you know empirically difficult as well. So I think from this standpoint, you know, if the ETS provide a more diversification with good track record, good performance record. I think ETF will probably have a you know, slight edge over the active mutual funds, you know, in terms of the um, you know transparency as well as the liquidity, as you can sell the ETF and you know anytime you want with you know for ETFs with good liquidity, and also um, you know the fact that you know it has a much lower fees than active uh, you know, actively managed uh, you know mutual funds. So uh, when you look at the performance, you have to take the cost total cost into account, not just the, uh, you know, uh, performance number, which have not, you know, include the total cost involved in, you know, trading the vehicles that I just discussed. It. Yeah, I think yeah. I agree quickly uh, to address a couple. I think today, in the past, obviously, we have, the, the, you know, we always get asked, we are ETF issuer, we always get, get asked, do I invest in mutual funds or ETF? I think you know it's never going to be just mutual funds or just ETF. It really depends how you allocate, uh, you know, in your active and passive mix. But our recommendation has always been at least 50-50. And then um, for a reason of Vincent mentioned the technicals, okay, the, liqui the liquidity, the transparency, and the cost. But in addition to that, I want to touch base on the allocations. In, you know, I, I used to manage uh, multi-asset portfolios. Uh, I used to allocate to an active managers in China, and he always tell me he has an active uh, overlay play uh, that uh, to access the new China, which I get very excited. Uh, and then I check the sector get outperformed twenty percent, but I don't see the alpha coming in. So I called the PM myself. He's my friend uh, over the years now. And he said, yes, I have 2% allocation in my portfolio. So you can imagine 20% of performance down to 2% of his allocation. And I have 2% allocation to his um, funds. So at the end of the day, you really get nothing uh, when you compare uh, you know, a true theme, you're trying to get access and generate an alpha. ETF today is very different from five, 10 years ago. You have a very rich list of choices to invest into certain broad beta play or certain thematic play, right? Like what we discussed today, consumer power, China technology companies, China e-commerce play. These specific sectors and theme and trending that are continue to gain momentums in the years to come have specific vehicles that allow you to invest, hence express a very clear asset allocation view uh, in your portfolio to gain the alpha's performance from there. Obviously, you know, that, that's down to your own choices of how you want to allocate between your active passive. Um, we never, you know, recommend clients one or the other. It really depends how you allocate. But we think overall, you would have a clearer uh, market view expressed, not another layer of, um, um, of um, manager's alpha cycle uh, that you have to bear and write through. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly address some of the questions. So I, I saw a couple of questions asking about the sanctions. So, you know, whether these companies will be affected by sanctions or, or some of the policies, you know, in, in, in mainland China. I think, you know, I, I think the big picture is that the, over, that the China internet company or internet company in general is really the future, you know, of the technology going forward. So you see, like, you know, Xiaolian mentioned, you see the Chinese people, you know, in mainland China paying with their mobile phone, uh, you know, do the online shopping, uh, you know, on different categories in grocery and now with fashion and some other products and also, you know, use the online platform to perform education purpose. So I think, you know, it's, a, it's really a huge trend going forward. So even with some sort of, you know, stand, uh, regulatory restriction we see, you know, in China or some of the 
potential so-called sanction, I don't think that would attract, you know, the, 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 you know, the general trend. So I'll give you ex an example. For example, you know, Tencent, you know, in last year you see a couple of, you know, headwinds regarding the restriction on, on, on the gaming sector, you know, where Chinese government imposed, you know, the, the time each uh, internet user can play the online games. Uh, and you see the, you know, share price, you know, go down, went down a little bit, but, you know, it quickly went up because, you know, the, uh, despite all this, you know, regulatory uh, restriction, you know, the online gaming market has seen more than 20 percent, uh, you know, growth every single year, regardless of all the regulatory, uh, you know, situation that we are facing. So I think, you know, you see Tencent already, you know, going up, you know, to to record high, you know, since the restriction story last year. So I think, you know, uh, the big picture is that the general trend will not change. I think it's really the government, how the government can better regulate the uh, internet giants, you know, with better transparency uh, and, and better, uh, you know, monitoring uh, in terms of, you know, how the government can, you know, get the data and, and so forth. But I think, you know, the general trend, even the government uh, 50, uh, 40 year, 14th, five year plan C, you know, the, the, the support on new economy and, you know, uh, and new uh, domestic consumption, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is also, you know, uh, you know, covered by all these online e-commerce companies. So I think, you know, the, the, the Chinese government, the Chinese government will not try to kill all these companies. They just try to, you know, make a better regulatory environment with better transparency. And, uh, you know, some other question, you know, I, you know, we are not supposed to comment on the single stuff. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, I cannot comment on this single stuff, whether, you know, whether NEO or Tesla is a better buy, you know, all these uh, single names. But, uh, you know, there are name, there are some, um, uh, there's a question about uh, the management fees and the expense ratio of the ETFs. And also, uh, we are not supposed to name the ETF, but, you know, when you are talking about the ETF that tracks the index here, uh, the expense ratio is uh, 72 um, uh, basis point, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then also, uh, if you look at the um, um, question here, uh, the performance, you know, like I said, 57% um, year to date um, for the ETF that tracks the index. Um, so uh, I will see there are other questions. You know, there's another question talking about the sharp ratio. You know, based on the Bloomberg, uh, 2.37 uh, for sharp one year, based on weekly data, um, and then how frequent uh, the internet, uh, the, the in index constituent being reviewed, uh, is semi-annual. Um, and what else? Um, what do you think is the outlook of U.S. tech stock right now that the COVID vaccine is inside? Well, I mean, we, we focus a lot on China, but obviously, you know, we are also bullish on new economy sector. So I think the internet or the technology will, you know, continue to do well, uh, you know, after post COVID. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Any, any other question? Okay, I think uh, we have come to the end of uh, our presentation uh, for today. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Vincent and Xiaoling for, for coming on uh, to share with our clients from Philip. So uh, uh, I think the rest of the questions uh, that uh, they can't answer, uh, we will try to leave it the answers uh, as, it, as it is. And then we'll try to type out the answers if uh, we can answer them. If not, uh, that will that'll be all for today. And uh, thank you so much for attending once again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night, yeah. everyone. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you. Thank you.